All right, our next presentation is Alan Komike from Reservoir Labs, and he is presenting Running Bro in the Cloud at Scale. Welcome, Alan. Thank you. So I have the privilege of the last, <laughs> the last one of the day. It's a little bit sparse in here. I assume everyone is, yeah, I assume everyone just went over to the other conference rooms. So uh, about me, Alan Komai, I'm from Reservoir Labs. I run engineering at Reservoir. Um, we build commercial bro systems. There's a few uh, different companies these days building commercial bro systems. It's nice to see the ecosystem moving forward. Um, we do far hardware, virtual machines, um, different services. That's how you get me. Now, before I actually get going into the main talk, there's one thing, oops, there we go, I need to say. So, people have been asking what happened. <laughs> So I love bicycle helmets. It's, uh, a um, service announcement for everyone. Um, so it's a public service announcement. If you're on a bicycle, wear a helmet. Because if I wasn't, there would be more than this. There'd be a lot more, and I probably wouldn't be standing here. Um, so yes, it was a bicycle crash. And if you want the gory details, I'm perfectly, and the doctors keep telling me it will heal, but it's not, so eventually it will. Um, okay, so we're not here to talk about that. We are here to talk about um, bro and cloudy sort of things. So I uh, talked to a lot of people, and the cloud is a big deal. Um, people are moving data centers to the cloud. There's security in the cloud. There's all sorts of things in the cloud. What does that really mean? And how do you take advantage of it? What are the issues? So this talk um, is a little bit rambling, uh, touches on a, a various different pieces on some of the issues, some of the, the, what you'll come up with if you move to the cloud. And that's something that we've been doing. We've been looking at, well, what is virtualization? What is cloud? What is containers? Um, and what are the different issues associated with it? So um, accessing packets is one thing. Um, scaling bro, a virtual instance of bro, is another one. And then measurement is another one. Uh, part of the big thing that we do at Reservoir, we, we're always measuring, we're always looking at performance, we're always asking why and how do we know. Um, so there's that. So that blue doesn't come out real well, but. Um, so not the cloud. You know, things that we're used to using with with on-premises um, traditional networking. You, know, you have the internet, you have the tubes in the internet. Um, and there's multiple places that you can tap. If it's your own infrastructure, you tap in the border before your switches and routers and firewalls. You, you tap after that. You get spans off of your switches and routers and, and everything. Um, you, you tap as you're going to the core. You tap inside your core. You have systems to protect and various different systems to protect. You have optical taps. You have physical taps. There's a lot of places you can get data when you're on premises and when you own everything. As you move into a more virtual environment, as you move into a more cloud environment, you have the tubes. That's the internet. You have some opaque channel. And then you have a bunch of elastic resources. There's not a lot of places to stick optical taps and split the light and get more data there. So, you know, that's how do we deal with that? So, the cloud. Um, so, it <laughs> starts out when people say, hey, what about the cloud? Go, well, what, what do you mean? Like, what, what part of this are you talking about? So, it could be your own infrastructure. You know, people talk about um, clouds on premises. They talk about building OpenStack. They talk about uh, VMware infrastructure. There's lots of things that can be on premises and can also be cloudy sort of things. Um, so traditional to um, uh, the normal networks that, that we're used to, in that you you own it. You could go to the data center and put a tap in somewhere and get all that data and, and work with it. So there is some virtualization that's happening, so you still have to get some visibility in there, but you have full control over everything, and, and that's good. The other one is hosted. It can be hosted on-prem, it can be hosted off-prem, and you have a lot of limited access. It can be multi-tenant, 
meaning that there are multiple people, multiple customers on the same infrastructure. And the infrastructure provider is very good about not letting you see someone else's data and not letting them see yours, which means you don't have access to any of the underlying switches and the underlying routers and underlying networking. So um, lack, of, lack of access to security policies don't let you access things anyway, even if you did have access. Um, and then there's virtual NICs versus real NICs. Now, a lot of chatter in the bro land was a lot of people asking, so what, is, what hardware are you using? How many cores, how much memory, what NICs are you using? Are you using Miracom, are you using Intel, are you using whatever? These are all virtual, and there is yet another layer of complexity there. Um, and identity. So I left that down on the bottom there. Um, when you're in a virtual world, uh, how do you identify something? So if it's a, a system on someone's desk and it's compromised, you know where it is. You know it's in that office. You know it's in that rack. You know where it is. If it's a virtual machine, part of virtualization, you know, the, the good part of virtualization is stuff can move. If one system, physical system is getting overloaded, it moves to another physical system. So what is identity in the cloud? And when you have a con log, and the con log says this, how is this? What is this? How do you know? OK. So things you want to do in the cloud. You want to protect the services. You want to protect the VMs that are running. Um, you want to protect the virtual switches and, and the overlay network and all that. You also want to run virtual bro. So if you have you know, cloud instances and virtual things in the cloud, you might want to run bro in there too. Um, and there's a bunch of issues with that. Packet delivery, packet delivery working with the virtual NICs, and scaling bro itself. Um, there's another aspect independent of those which are cloud scale apps. So there's one thing where you take your data center, you take your, your, your physical machines, move them to virtual machines, move the virtual machines into the data center, and you just have a data center like it used to look, which is a stack of virtual machines. There's the other thing where you develop cloud applications. Now these are what people see about large, uh, microservices and many, many different microservices. Each microservice does its own independent thing, and they talk to each other over some infrastructure. Um, containers come into play there. Virtual systems come into I, I tend to use containers and VMs interchangeably. Uh, the, the underlying infrastructure changes some, but yeah, it's kind of the same. But um, when you're moving, you're, you're data center to the cloud. You know, the, the same sort of things apply. It's just a bunch of VMs in a rack. So you want to watch the border. You want to watch the core. You want to watch the virtual things. You want to understand the topology. You want to say what talks to what. When it's a cloud scale app, when there's all these microservices talking over SSL, then there's no open ports. There's like one. It's SSL for one thing to talk to another. You don't have traditional users um, using traditional services. You're not looking at DNS. You're not looking at DGAs for DNS. Um, there's all these services talking to each other. So there's what we call service level identity in that looking at the certificates that are going between those different microservices, you could say, well, what is that service? What is that service? What does my topology say? You know, Typical security. The security, you look at topology. Who should be able to talk to two, who? You look at the certificates between those and say, well, these actually shouldn't be talking. And even at the same time, it's just SSL. It's just microservices talking. But it's software. It's operating systems. And as we see every few months, there's bugs in various levels of the stack. So even if it's only SSL that should be talking, you still want Bro running to say, well, what is actually talking? Did someone open up port 22? Is there SSH? Does it look like things that are happening that shouldn't really be happening? So we're transitioning a little bit from, if you're looking at these cloud scale apps, from 
protocols and ports being important that tell it what's going on to identities of the different microservices and what's going on with there. Now, this all seems to change with SSL 1.3. So I learned something um, at this BroCon that SSL 1.3 doesn't give you the certificate information. So some things we need to learn how to do a little bit different with SSL going forward with Bro. We'll see how that works out. Um, okay. So visibility in the cloud. Um, basically, how do I see my packets? You know, this is starting to get into the, the meat of what we're talking about. So you have a bunch of VMs. How do I see my packets? What, what do I do to do that? Um, most of the commercial cloud vendors, and even if you spin up your own virtual things, um, they don't provide a tap service. You can't say, I want to tap the virtual switch. I want to get a span. I want to do something and see all my packets that's going on. You have all the individual nodes, and that's all you can see is what's on that node. So there's two ways to do it. Um, one of them is node agents. The other one is if you happen to be in a system that allows um, spans, or mirror, spans or mirrors on virtual switches, you're in a good shape. And we'll talk about who does that and where. Um, so agents. Um, let's say I have two VMs. And we can take, or multiple VMs, we can take the, put an agent on one of those VMs. That agent reads the packets and forwards those packets somewhere else over tunnel. So the agent basically goes and says, well, I'm a tap. And the agent says, read, basically, read, let's say it's reading ether zero. And that gets all the packets for ether zero, passes it to your bro over a tunnel. The simplest way of doing that, do I have? Yep, there we go. Um, so the do-it-yourself tap service, agents in a cloud. If you TCP dump on ETH0 and write that to standard out, so let's say your, your virtual machine had ETH0, so you're reading all the packets off of ETH0, and your virtual machine is also doing whatever it's supposed to be doing on ETH0, um, then you could pass that to NC or Netcat or NCAT or you know, whichever version of NC you're happy with. Um, over some port and then pass it over the network. So you're basically tunneling packets somewhere else. And that gives you a packet stream. You know, this is, in essence, a virtual tap. On the other side, you can create some dummy interface on some other machine. So this is another machine. Now, in order to create a dummy interface, you have to use the IP command. Um, old school. I use everything as if config. You can't create, as far as I know, you can't create a new interface um, using if config. But so whenever I can, I fall back to if config because I've been using that for 20 something years. Um, for, you know, th there is a way to do all the if config stuff using the IP command. Um, that is the future, at least until someone renames it to something else. But you know, I put them both there. I can never remember this syntax. I remember the if config syntax. So basically, you create some dummy device. It's an Ethernet device, but it doesn't really do anything. Um, bring it up, give it an IP address. Um, I, I was playing with this and testing it stuff. It doesn't doesn't work without an IP address. So you know, some RFC 1918 space IP it doesn't matter what it is. And then you assuming this, you do this on my bro IP then you get the packets coming in. So the packets, oh, different ports. These two ports should be the same, cut and paste. Um, so this says read, and we only want one minus one dash K also. So much for cut and paste. Um, so this will read the packets coming in off of port one, two, three, four, or if we send it to port 5,000, either way. TCP replay it back into um, the packet fabric, and then if you have bro stood up and read from packet fabric, then bro will be reading packets off of this machine. So basically what we're doing is here. We have our virtual network, dick zero, call that eth zero, the network coming in. We have an agent reading from here, sending to there. 
packet tunneling it over to somewhere else, de-encapsulating it, that's what this NC is doing, sending it to Dominic, and then Dominic is bringing it to Bro. And you could do this on multiple machines. Um, that way, so if you have a bunch of VMs and you want to tap all the data on the VMs, you just send it all there and doing that. Um, so it can get more complicated. Um, there are commercial vendors that do this. You can use more complicated tunnels. You can use GRE tunnels or different type of tunnels. But in essence, you know, this is all the same. All the, the vendors, I, I like to pick on Gigamon. Um, I, I like the orange boxes, they work well, I use them. But there are a lot of other vendors that are doing this sort of stuff. Um, Gigamon and Ixia are, are two of them, two of the, the bigger ones. But basically their physical hardware and their virtual hardware is the same. If you want to tap in a virtual environment, um, you could purchase their stuff or <laughs> start with TCP dump and NC um, and TCP replay or other tools that do similar things. Net, net sniff NG will do similar things. And that builds you a, basically a, a packet fabric to, to do this sort of stuff. Um, so it's really all the stuff, but it, it all comes down to that's all it's really doing. So you can go home and play with that. Um, virtual switches. So if you're in a virtual environment, you have virtual switches, you probably have Open vSwitch OVS. Um, different environments will have different switches. I can have Cisco switches. You can, you can um, specifically VMware switches. But um, if you have Open, open vSwitch and a um, fairly new version of Open vSwitch, you could, and you're working, working with OpenStack, um, then there's Tap as, as a Service. So what Tap as a Service does um, here's their, out of their documentation on what Tap, of a, ser, ser, tap as a Service is doing. Um, in, it's looking at the switch and doing a virtual tap on the switch. Um, and it abides by the multi-tenant aspects of it. So it understands that um, it won't give you packets that you're not supposed to see if there's someone else's packets. And so it deals with groups and it deals with ACLs and it deals with all that stuff. So it's multi-tenant aware, but allows you to reach back out to the switch because most, most virtual hardware, you can't access the virtual switches, the virtual environments because someone else's packets are on there too. And TAP as a service lets you do that. Um, the other way to do this is if you have access to the switch itself, if it's your own infrastructure, you could use SDN to do that. So basically that's what OpenStack is doing. It's going and reprogramming the OVS switch using group and select tables um, if you have that infrastructure. And if Nick is here, go bother him about how to do SDN stuff. I don't see him here. Okay, so let's say we have our packets. Uh, the story so far, we, ha we have data in the cloud, um, we have agents somehow forwarding the data, whether they're from spans on virtual switches, real switches, they are agents, whatever. We have a tap hack fabric in place, so all the packets are going somewhere. Um, and we have Bro running on a node. But how do we do that in the cloud? And how do we make that scale? So um, simple setup is backhaul. And that's what a lot of people do. Um, you have your stuff in the cloud and you backhaul it back home. So you have some cloud instance, you bring things up in the cloud, whether it's on-prem or outside prem. You backhaul the packets all to one place over some tunnel, over some link, and you run bro like normal on normal bro hardware. Um, you know, it could be Corelight hardware, our reservoir hardware, you've rolled your own hardware, whatever it is. Um, various different tunnels to, to do that. but. This is something that is simple. You don't have to worry about running Bro in a, in a virtual way. Um, again, picking on Kigamon a little bit, um, just because I've used them. I haven't used a lot of other, other gear to do this. Um, their fabric does virtual to physical, and it just your packets show up where you want them to show up. You give them money, they give you packets. <laughs> a lot of money. 
it, that orange paint is really expensive. Um, okay. So let's say you're not backhauling. Let's say you want to actually run Bro in the cloud that your packets are in. Um, so how do we do that? Um, and how do we scale Bro? How do we distribute those packets across the Bro workers? And there's a few different ways. You know, BPFs, RSS scaling, um, multi nics a bunch of different ways of doing it. So let's let's get into that. Um, so simple and old school BPFs. Now, this has been in Bro for forever, basically. Um, we were doing this many years ago um, in, in distributing um, packets between various different bro workers. So um, sit the NIC is promiscuous all, promiscuous, all the workers read from the same NIC, so they get all the same data. That's good, but not very scalable. We want each worker to see what nth of the data. So we could set up a BPF. Um, I think, Robin, you probably wrote this initially. Is that yours? Um, <laughs> you don't remember? I don't, I don't remember where that came from. It, it was initially on like the bro mailing list in 2001 or something. I don't remember who came up with that originally. Yeah. Right. Um, we'll certainly have used that for splicing them. Yeah. yeah. But the thing is, this is in Bro now. I mean, we don't have to figure this out again. It was Vern or, Bro or Robin or someone figured this out once. We put it in Bro, and it's there for everyone to use, and it's been there forever. Um, so Pack Filter Utils Bro has this nice thing, and you give it the number of, basically it's the number of workers and which worker this is, and it fills all that in. And it's basically source desk. So it, it, it's looking at parts of the source and parts of the desk. Um, even better though, there's a script and all you have to do is say at load, load balance bro. If you're running a cluster, it figures out how many nodes that you have or how many workers in the cluster um, and does all the load balancing for you. So if you have um, virtual NIC on a system, you don't have any resources underneath, you don't have NetMap, you don't have PFRing, you don't have any of that stuff. Uh, to distribute your packets between workers to scale that bro, all you have to do is you know, that line, and then everything works. So that's using phrases that we had before. Really cool. Um, other ways to do this. BPF. I'm going to go a little bit into BPF. Um, so the BP, from the, the original 1993 paper, BSD Packet Filter, um, it, it, BPF is actually a little virtual machine assembly language that lives today inside the Unix kernel, among other places. So um, if we run TCP dump dash, so normally you, a lot of times you use P BPFs with TCP dump. So I want to say, I want to see everything on port 80, for example. Um, that's really assembly language. You know, the dash D dumps the assembly, and this is what it looks like. This is the BPF assembly, and there is a JIT inside the kernel that turns this into x86 or ARM or PowerPC, I think, assembly language, and it runs really fast. So we can use BPFs, and it has fairly low overhead. Um, and rather than writing assembly, you know, TC dump, TCP dump and live PCAP have a much higher level uh, interface to it. You might see enhanced BPF. So I'm down the rabbit hole. So this, this is kind of off to the side, but I thought it was really cool, and a lot of people don't know about this, so I have a chance that I'm going to talk about it. Um, so the man page for um, BPF and talks about enhanced BPF is a universal in-kernel virtual machine. So the point is that inside the Linux kernel, there is a universal virtual machine that you can dump any code into, and it will run it, which is a little bit weird. Um, there is even a compiler for that. So you don't have to write assembly language. You could write C code for BPFs that will run inside the kernel. And basically, that allows instrumentation for all sorts of stuff. Um, again, out of a library, um, um, 
and I'm blanking on the name. I, I always blame, the last few weeks I've been blaming, blaming concussion when I don't remember anything. So uh, that is somebody that I'm not remembering his name. But anyway, um, BPFs. So um, there's all sorts of hooks in the kernel, including you know, networking in here, that you can do all sorts of interesting things with and measurements. Um, so go here and look at what's there. If you're looking at tuning systems, if you're looking at performance on systems, and that's something that we do a lot at Reservoir, and why is this running the way it is running? Um, and you could measure how long processes take, how long they take to wake up, how long they shut down, how long I.O. is taking, all sorts of very low-level granular things within the Linux kernel, you know, all this stuff. Um, you could write a little program and get the results out of it and do this. So I'm not back out of the rabbit hole, but you know, do that. Go here, look at that. It's really cool stuff. It has nothing to do with what we're doing here. Um, OK. Receive side scaling. Um, this works. So RSS is a typical way of distributing packets. Um, Virtual RSS, so you know, th this was out of um, PF Ring's documentation or their website. It was a really nice little picture. I didn't have to draw it my own, so I cut and based it. It goes here. But basically, RSS says that incoming packets get distributed to various different workers. In a virtual sense, um, what it does is each queue gets assigned to CPU. So if you pin bro workers to CPUs, which you can do really easily in bro code config, then you can distribute your packets that way in a virtual system. Um, virtual switches. So um, if you have access to the virtual switch, if it's on your hardware and you're playing with your own hardware, then um, you can basically tap off of the virtual switches. There's some extensions in OBS 2.7 that allows for five triple hashing. This is kind of the secret. Oops. Let's go back. This is the secret command that you need to, to understand to do that. Again, find Nick and he'll explain that. OK. Um, AF packet works too in the virtual sense, in the virtual systems. Um, as long as you have the right kernel, the right driver, the right everything. If packet has been a little iffy recently. Uh, I think it's pretty much working well now. But um, it's hardware agnostic. It's all kernel stuff. Um, there's interfaces for DPDK. So if you have Intel NICs, especially um, on the host side, then through virtual switches and through the guest, there's less copies. It's working pretty well. Um, so that's something else to play with. Um, OK. So, hey, I missed. There we go. Measuring bro. So, um, the last aspect of what I want to talk about is measurement, and you know, that's part of where EBB, eBPF came from. Um, so, if you're in the cloud, part of the cloud is elasticity, and and in, in essence, unlimited resources. Um, there's dollars that come with those resources, but part of having things in the cloud is you can scale. You, you can say, well, if I'm out of resources, just give me more. Um, and the give me more part is really nice. Um, so vertical scalability is what we've been talking about is bro on a single box. How, how many workers can we get on a virtual box? How we scale the workers on that one virtual node? Um, horizontal scalability, scalability is just more bro nodes. And when you're in the cloud, so a lot of people set up the clusters, and I have a cluster of n nodes. I have a cluster of two nodes, three nodes, four nodes. I think Ashish said he had six nodes or something like that. Um, as you scale, that starts breaking down. So when you're doing cloud stuff, basically you have a tree of bros. You have a set of managers, a set of nodes with those managers, and that gives you the scalability you need. You can't keep going with one manager and more and more nodes with that manager. So as you're scaling things in the cloud, you're ending up with trees of bros. You're distributing traffic across all of those you know, in various different ways with various different switch fabrics, either roll your own fabric or not roll your own fabric. 
um, and you're dynamically scaling. So that's where the give me more comes from. Um, if some, and you're measuring as things get overloaded, you're adding more. And assuming failures. So chaos monkey. Um, this is from Netflix. So one thing that Netflix does really well is they run a program they call Chaos Monkey that randomly goes and shoots things or breaks things or tweaks things. And you need to assume that. If you're running in the cloud, assume things are going to break. They're going to fall over. They're going to stop. They're not going to be available anymore. And that's the hard part. When things go away, how do you recover from that? You want to do the same thing when you're running on box, but it's, you have another level of difficulty there. there we go. Um, so measuring. Um, when you're in the cloud and you have a dropped packet, um, the pri that means the prior layer had no room for, um, for that packet to come in. And why didn't it have any more room? Well, generally, there was a buffer that was full. Um, so packet comes off the wire. There's no room in the hardware. The packet gets dropped. Um, packet comes off of the hardware into a software ring buffer. There's no room in the software ring buffer. The packet gets dropped. Depending upon the architecture, there are multiple places for these packets to get dropped. Um, when you're in a virtual environment, there's the host, there's the guest, there's the hypervisor. There are multiple places, multiple rings in there. And any one of those places, packets can get dropped, the rings can get full. And how do you know when you're running on your guest at some high level software layer and you're reading from that software, that software says, hey, you're getting zero packet drops. Well, how do you know you weren't seeing packet drops on the host side, or on the NIC side, or in the hypervisor side? So those are things that you need to deal with. Um, so understanding the packet path is really important. Understand the software that you have in there when you're, when you're looking at things. Um, each buffer FIFO is important as a place that, that packets can drop. Um, and try to measure each point. And the thing about measuring is some of those points are opaque. So you can't actually measure. But if you know something at one point, you could add up downstream and make sure it all adds up. So if you know the amount of data coming from an upstream switch into your system, and you know the amount of data that's coming to bro, and Bro says, I'm not dropping any packets, but that data doesn't add up. You are dropping packets somewhere in that chain. And that's where you need to go and start looking at, well, what is the hypervisor actually telling me? If you have access to the host, what is the host actually telling me? If it's opaque and you can't see it, then you just need to know that, well, something's going wrong. Something isn't happening right here. So you could set some time frame, deliver X packets, whether it's a TCP replay, you want to do a test, or you do it for real, look at all drop points, add them up, and see if it adds up. Um, often it doesn't add up, especially when you get to high speeds. Um, so this way I said limited visibility. But you have to find some place that's truth upstream. If it's a packet broker, if it's a switch, if it's something upstream. Um, you know that this thing isn't lying. <laughs> this, this is actually telling me the amount of packets that I really have. And then start looking at measurements at various points, any points that you can, to determine what's going on in the system. Because we, we've seen a lot of systems that, that, that tell us everything's look, looking great, but it's really not. And, and that's one of the most difficult parts in the, in the virtual world. Um, so one thing that's interesting NetFlow-ish information. So even if you can't get at upstream switches or tap egg points, you might be able to get some NetFlow or NetFlow-ish information that might be able to give you inf enough information, or at least close to information, as to what's going on upstream. And that's it. Um, so that's me. Um, we have a uh, preview of uh, so. 
talking about virtualization, we have a preview of a VM coming up. It's downloadable, it's free, download it. And we're also hiring. No, the theme, the theme of the day. So I had to throw that out. Um, questions? Burn. So uh, this is an interesting talk, thank you. Um, regarding the last point you made about not knowing the loss rates, I was wondering how much mileage you would get out of using the capture loss script, which really ought to give you some sense of loss rate. Um, true, it, it will give you that, right, if you're looking at sequence numbers, and that, that will give you some aspect of what's going on. Um, I mean, at least you'll know, you, you right. can either have confidence you probably don't have a problem or you do. Where the problem is, if you do, that's a headache. But, but if you have confidence saying, I don't think I have a problem, great. Yeah, I, looking at capture loss, you know, I will tell you if the, there's gaps in sequence numbers. Um, you don't know if that's part of what's happening on the network, if that should be happening. You, know, it, you might be, be being fed poor data anyway. So I'm sorry, you, you might be, be so you can, you can be getting all the packets you're expecting to be getting, but there's even somewhere further upstream that's dropping packets and your sequence numbers. Well, but the, the script leverages acknowledgments. So it knows the endpoint saw the thing you didn't see, and therefore it really is a drop. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. So, so it, it should be a robust indication. Yeah. Good point. Other questions? All right, cool. And we're done for the day. Thank you. Thank you.